information produced by drug companies, patient groups, and professional organizations emphasize the idea that bipolar disorder is caused by chemical imbalance in the brain. Does the research support this statement? So this idea that uh, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder are caused by chemical imbalances has been widely promoted over the last couple of decades by the pharmaceutical industry um, and by patient groups and by professional groups as well. There's, there's absolutely no evidence at all that there's a biochemical imbalance in any of these conditions, but certainly not in bipolar disorder. In bipolar disorder, there isn't even a theory. At least there's a theory in, in depression, even, the, even if there's no evidence to back it up. And at least there's a theory, and there have been several theories in uh, schizophrenia and psychosis. Again, there's no evidence to back them up. Um, but in bipolar disorder, there isn't even a theory that hasn't stopped the, the message from being propagated all over the place. And of course, it's a message that helps to sell drugs because you need the drug to rectify the chemical imbalance and it helps to keep people on the drugs for years. The idea that there's a chemical imbalance is often coupled with the idea that this is a lifelong condition and you've got to keep taking the tablets. Can I just uh, add to that in that, you know, a lot of people whose lives are not very good, whether they're living in stressful situations or poverty or abusive situations and so on, are gonna have some level of mental distress. But the fact that we take that and then sort of jam that round peg into the square hole of depression is really a phenomena that, that continues to amaze me. That of all, the, of all the life stresses and the life problems that many people have, and I'm not saying that, that people are malingering when they go to the doctor and complain about not being very happy with their lives, that they suddenly are told that you have a chemical imbalance. You know, th th this is the idea of taking a social situation and creating a medical situation out of it. And I think that the other area that we see this happen routinely and without people even thinking about it is where you've got young, mostly boys, who are rambunctious. Um, they run around the classroom and they throw things and they don't sit still and they yell a lot. And the teacher um, tells the parent that your son, usually it's a boy, um, needs to go and, and possibly get checked out by a psychologist or psychiatrist. And they'll go to the family doctor and the doctor will say, yes, it looks like your son has some level of attention deficit disorder and that results usually in a, an amphetamine-like uh, stimulant, which will work, will calm the person down, calm the boy down. The question is, when you cram 25 or 30 kids in a classroom with one teacher and you've got two or three of them who are extremely disruptive. It makes it difficult for the teacher to do their job, and therefore, you need those kids to be calmed down. So the, the pressure, we've created a social situation instead of, um, you know, maybe the teacher needs an aid, or maybe those boys just need to go out and run outside a little bit more. Um, we've created this social situation, which becomes a medical situation. And I can tell you, there are some serious, problems with doing so because once you've declared someone or give someone a diagnosis of attention deficit disorder they're going to carry that diagnosis probably for the rest of their lives probably to not any benefit I, I'm absolutely confident that I would have been placed on these drugs as a child. I couldn't sit in my seat to save my life <laughs> okay, okay, can, I, can I just say one other thing we did a study in British Columbia uh, colleagues of mine and we looked at the rates of uh, if you're interested in me talking about uh, attention deficit disorder for a second, we looked at the rates of attention deficit disorder prescribed, the, the drugs that were prescribed for this, and we found something very interesting. We found that the boys, well, boys and girls, that were born between January and June, and we took that as a cohort, and we compared it to the boys born between July and December. And we found that the rate of attention deficit diagnosis was twice as high in the boys who were born in the latter part of the year. So you might say, what is going, we call this the birth month effect. We study this and it's been replicated in other studies in the world, by the way. If you were unfortunate like I was to be born at the end of November, your, my likelihood of 
being diagnosed with attention deficit disorder is twice as high as it would be as if I were born in January. What's going on there? Well, the kids who are the younger kids in the classroom, right? Because in a, in a grade school, you've got kids who are born on January 1st and kids who are born on December 31st, and they're, they're a year apart, but they're all in the same classroom. Those kids who are the youngest in the classroom are actually uh, prescribed um, ADHD drugs at a much higher rate than those who are born at the beginning of the year. So that really calls into question the whole diagnosis. Are we, what are we actually medicating here? We're medicating the unfortunate chance that a son was born in December as opposed to January. Um, and, and this to me shows the malleability of diagnoses, right? Where the kid, of course he can't sit still. He's a year younger than a lot of his classmates. He just needs to be running around more doing, you know, he learns at a different rate, but that's not recognized. Becomes a patient, gets a drug. And let's go back to depression. That, that's worthy of applause. Because <laughs> I, I know I would have been put in a chemical straitjacket <laughs> if they had had him back then. But let's go back to depression for a second. So, because we don't talk about what the, the natural antidepressants are. So exercise is as good as a drug. Sunlight, 30 minutes of direct sunlight a day is as good as the drug. Uh, so there are things that we can do that are as good as the drugs, uh, again, that never get talked about, that don't, that don't have harmful side effects. So getting outside and getting 30 minutes of direct sunlight a day, uh, if, if you can't do that, if you live in the Ohio River Valley or London fog, well, I guess it burns off in the afternoon, doesn't it? Uh, a full spectrum <laughs> light. Um, so getting proper lighting, especially during the winter, uh, hydrating properly, exercising, all these things are, are major antidepressants that are available without cost. How are statistics used to mislead people in drug advertisements? Okay. Hmm. I have whole lectures devoted to that very question. I could answer that with a, a dozen different conditions. But let me just give you this simple example which really kind of um, shocked me one day, and I realized I have to be involved in educating people about this. And this has to do with osteoporosis, okay? So, in the mid-90s, in 1995, there was a, a new drug that was coming onto the market uh, produced by a company called Merck. And this uh, drug, known as Fosamax, you've probably heard of it before, was tested in more than 4,000 women. And these women were diagnosed with osteoporosis. Now, the diagnosis itself, I would argue, is very controversial and probably almost fraudulent. But let's say you've got these women who've been told that they have low bone density. They're two and a half standard deviations below the mean. So they have lower bone density than other women of their, of their age or of the age that they would have been when they had the highest bone density. So these women have been given a label. They have osteoporosis. They're put in a trial, there's 4,000 of them. 2,000 of them get the drug. 2,000 of them get the placebo. Now the reason why you are concerned about osteoporosis, the main thing is that if you have weaker bones, you could fall and break a hip. And broken hips, quite frankly, are a public health problem. A lot of elderly people will fall and break a hip, and that will be the beginning of the end. They'll end in a, ho in a hospital. They may, uh, they may die from that. So preventing the hip fractures is a really good thing. So this drug was promoted as preventing 50% of women from having hip fractures. And I saw those numbers and I was blown away. And I said, well, what does the study say? Well, the study of 4,000 women, 2,000 got the placebo, 2,000 got the drug. They followed them for almost four years. So let me ask you this, how many of the women who are on placebo, so these are women in their 60s and 70s, for four years, how many of those women had a hip fracture? They had no treatment, they had a placebo, which is a inactive uh, sugar pill. How many of them had a, had a hip fracture, what do you think? None. Uh, well, it wasn't quite none. <laughs> so. So percentage-wise, was it 10%? These are high-risk women, okay? These are high-risk women. What percentage of them had a hip fracture in four years? 5%? Is it 10%? Okay. The answer was 2%. 2% of women had a hip fracture. 
Oh, well, what about the women who are taking Fosamax, the drug? 1% of those women had a hip fracture. One in 100. So when you went from 2% down to 1%, that was a 50% reduction. If I had my slides, I will show you the ad where they are marketing this drug as having a 50% reduction in hip fractures when it's only a 1% difference between the two groups. The drug does not help 99% of the women who take it, but is promoted to our doctors and to, frankly, to us as consumers as having a 50% reduction. And if you've ever known someone that's had a hip fracture and that's been the beginning of a very difficult portion in their life, you'll want to do something to prevent that hip fracture. And if someone tells you a drug is going to prevent it uh, by 50%, you're going to say, why wouldn't you take that drug? You'd be an idiot not to take that drug. But really, the drug helps 1% of people. And the side effects, in fact, that drug, the first year it was on the market, had the most reported adverse effects of any drug in the United States. There were more than 6,000 cases of uh, reports of severe esophageal burning and uh, gastrointestinal problems and so on. The drug is very caustic. This was, by the way, the beginning of the osteoporosis industry. And if you read any of my books, all of which have a chapter on osteoporosis, you realize how angry this makes me because so many of our mothers and our sisters and our aunts and our grandmothers are being deceived by this idea that they have to medicate uh, what they've been told is to be low bone density because of a 50% uh, drug that offers a 50% reduction. By the way, that, that kind of statistical manipulation, once I saw it with osteoporosis, I started seeing it everywhere. Cholesterol lowering, blood pressure drugs, drugs for diabetes, drugs for depression, and so on. That kind of what we would call using relative risk reductions as opposed to absolute re risk reductions. And the absolute is, how many people out of 100 would benefit from that drug? And in this case, it was one in 100. So the, the other thing that I find quite fascinating, if you've got this group of 4,000 women, and only 2% of the women on the, on, the, on the placebo had a hip fracture, what does that mean? That means that these high-risk women, they had a 98% chance of not having a hip fracture. So do they ever tell you that? Yes, you know, dear um, Marjorie, we, we've, been, you know, we've, we've discovered that you've got osteoporosis. Uh, I'm going to put you on this drug. Where the person should say, well, what's my chance of having a hip fracture, say, in the next three or four years? If the doctor was honest, they say, well, when they studied the drug, 98% of women who are high risk like you did not have a hip fracture. Mm -hmm.